much. That's my uh, great mentor and colleague, David Stokely. Um, uh, and uh, I stand on the shoulders of giants, and he is the giant. So I'm delighted to welcome you all here tonight. And uh, there are some young members in the audience, which is excellent. You're particularly welcome. Uh, and I hope maybe to share some of the the research with you. And we're going to start with demographics. Can you hear me if, if I move out like this? Excellent. So for most of uh, humanity, about 3 to 4 percent of populations lived to over 65. This was even true in Socrates' time. Socrates, of course, himself was forced to take poison because he was polluting the minds of the young. But his three great colleagues, fellow philosophers and poets, all lived to ripe old ages. This is in 400 BC, 80 years, 79, and 75 years. So a certain proportion of society did live about 3 to 4 percent to over 65, as long as we have records, as long as we know. But since the 1800s, a remarkable thing has been happening. Over that period of time between then and now, there has been about a doubling in human life expectancy. And this has come from countries that have accurate records since that period of time. What that means is, on average, we're living five hours longer per year, that's what those sums add up to, or three sorry, five hours longer per day, or three months per year. And that translates into a baby girl born in Ireland today will probably live, on average, three months longer than her one-year-old sister. Obviously a very active family year on year. <laughs> so, the biggest increase, because of the baby boom and other factors, proportionately, and due to this extended lifespan that we will see, is in people over the age of 85. So a marked increase over 85, but a particularly dramatic increase, a 400% increase in the proportion of people who will be living more than 100. And later on, we're going to talk about some of the factors that will, I hope, uh, encourage and help Maybe five or six of you in this room to live to a hundred. Yeah, but I'm not telling you who you are. <laughs> Nobody in the front seat. <laughs> so, so we're living longer, extended lifespan. Coupled with that, fertility rates are dropping worldwide. So you can see here in 2011, globally, the proportion of people over 65 has surpassed the proportion in population level under five. The countries with the uh, longest longevity, Japan is top of the list, we know this. Italy, France, Germany, Belgium, Greece, in rank order. Ireland, not too bad. We're about, uh, I think it's 13th or 19th on the list. And there's very little uh, in the difference there between the uh, life expectancy for both sexes in Japan of 83.7 years and Ireland of 81.4 years. So again, what does that mean? At birth, the life expectancy here is 80 for a man and 83 for a woman. But if you make it to 65, which portion of the audience have already done, and congratulations. On average, you will live another 21 years as a, a female and 18 as a man. And if you make it to 75, and I can see a few in the audience bristling, another 11 and 13 years consecutively. And if you make it to 85, almost seven additional years. So lifespan is of course, very important at birth, and that we know this data, this figures at birth, but it's particularly important as, as we're evolving through these changes to understand the implications. Really important for policymakers to understand these implications. 
So if you're 85 now sitting in the audience, you're very likely as a woman to make it to 92, and some of you will hit 100. Why? What are the reasons for this clearly clear data, and I'm only talking about Western populations, of course. Better healthcare, immunization, antibiotics, uh, better quality of life, better quality water, food, hygiene, better housing, better lifestyles, and more prosperity. There are the factors that in the first instance influenced infant mortality, and then once those cohorts got beyond 15 and made it to 15, parents sometime in the 1800s would sigh a sigh of relief because that meant that that person was very likely to make it through to adulthood, and now with our uh, ability to treat adult infections, etc., longevity is as we've shared. So, when we're born, we're pretty much all the same. And, and I'm going to take you through a little narrative now about how and why we age, maybe, maybe we age differently, and when this transition takes place. So we're all pretty much of a muchness when we're born. But after a period of time, heterogeneity sets in. We change. And, and that heterogeneity is very much part of the aging process. And understanding that heterogeneity is part of what contributes to how we understand why people get older and how they get older and what the process means. So that when we are, say, 65, we're very different at 65. So what are the factors that influence that? There's a fantastic study in New Zealand called the Dunedin study. And unlike Tilda, where we take people from age 50 and follow them every two years, Dunedin has followed a single birth cohort from birth. So it's followed the same group of participants, same period of time as we do in Tilda every two or three years, and identified from this follow-up some of the processes that take place in younger ages. And a really remarkable finding from the study is this. The difference between chronological age and biological age, even at age 38. So, this slide represents everybody at age 38, because their cohort were birth cohort, all born the same year, and followed up every two or three years. So this is everybody at age 38. Their chronological age is 38. However, we have ways of measuring biological aging. And they were able to take these tools for measuring biological aging and look at the cellular age of their cohort. And lo and behold, they found a huge spread. So even at age 38, we're seeing this dramatic heterogeneity in biological age, such that some of the cohort were behaving biologically like 30-year-olds, and some almost like 50-year-olds. A 20-year difference biologically in these people mean age 38. And the factors which influenced aging, this biological aging, were some of the things that we're going to talk about now. Adverse child events, depression in the home, alcohol in the home, poverty, socioeconomic status keeps coming up time and time again in ours and, and these research studies as being a major factor contributing to aging and disability chronic, impaired, degenerative diseases and ageing, and disability. Well, what was interesting when they then took health assessments very like we do in Tilda and applied them to the cohort, was that those who were behaving like 30-year-olds, although they were 38, biologically, were younger with, with respect to function of almost all of the organs they looked at, the kidney function, their heart function, their lung function, their musculoskeletal function, their muscles, their bones, etc., their cholesterol levels, 
their glucose levels with respect to diabetes. Whereas this group behaved, all of them, with all of those organs acting in an older biological way. So from that we can take that not only is there a big difference between chronological and, and, and biological aging, not only do these changes start very early on, but they are multi-organ. So you don't just age at this stage in one organ, but it's happening in all of the organs. And we know this from a lot of animal work with respect to the aging process. So the aging process, although it may manifest in some people as a heart attack, first of all, or a stroke, or Alzheimer's disease, all of the background changes that are taking place are taking place in most of the organs in the body. We see it in Tilda. This is a lovely way of, of demonstrating it using what we call a timed up and go test. So sitting on a chair, you stand up, you walk six meters, turn, walk back, and sit down again. And any of you in the audience who are participants will know this test. And we find that here, at age 50, there's a pretty tight distribution for that very simple task, okay? Nearly everybody is doing it at the same pace. 55, a little bit broader. 65, a little bit more of a distribution now. We're getting more variation in how people apply that test. 75, broader again. And 85, quite a broad distribution, showing the heterogeneity in that response, which is age related. And in women, that's for men, even more of a spread. But look at this in the context of what I've just told you about the mean. This person here, at age 85, is functioning the same as some of those who are aged 50 in the study. Again, the same implications that we talked about. Chronological age versus biological age. So that's heterogeneity. And that's the fact that the aging process starts very early on. It starts earlier than 38. It actually starts in the womb, but nobody here tonight is going to be able to do anything about that. Now, one of the, one of the factors which triggered the TILDA study and feeds into what we've just shared is the huge difference in extended lifespan for over 65s, healthy lifespan across Europe. So not only are people living longer in different countries, but the period of time that is spent without a disease or a disorder or a diagnosis after 65, that's what we call healthy life years, is also very different. This is Sweden, and they're top of the chart in Europe. So if you make it to 65 in <clears throat> Sweden, you're likely to live another 19 years as a man and another 22 years as a woman. 84% of those extra life years after the age of 65 in Sweden for a man are spent in good health with no disability. 84%. Quality years. For women, it's 77%. Ireland, how do we fare with these additional life years after 65? Men can expect to live another 18 and women another 21 years. But look at the healthy life years during that period of time. 61% for a man. And 57% for a woman. So understanding what contributes to that aging process that we've talked about earlier on, because aging is all about this. It's about disability and disorders and disease in, ex in the extended life years. Will help us to actually identify early factors which determine these differences and hopefully at an individual level but also at a societal level make changes which will make Ireland a better place in which to grow up. We're constantly being asked in Tilda can you tell from the data what a super ageist, a super ager is? I know what super ageists are. <laughs> what a super ager is. Now this is difficult, and there are actually no clear definitions for what is meant by this. Yes. 
It seems reasonable to assume that if you have no diseases, no disorders, and you're on no medications or no drugs, that that might constitute a good aging, a good aging. Either that or you absolutely hate your doctor and you don't want to go near medics, possibility. So we used this definition in Tilda to see well, how, how frequent are super ages in Ireland using this definition. Over the age of 50, using this definition, just over 12% of people in Ireland meet those criteria. And it drops right down to 2.3% over 75. So that is such a minority of people over 50 that that cannot constitute what we mean by super-aging. We need to think of another definition. But I think it's an interesting statistic. I was very surprised by how low those figures are. And I'll explain to you in a moment about the TILDA study and how confident we can be in generalising the TILDA data. So, first of all, why do we age? Um, which genes extend lifespan? Are there, are there genes, are there components that extend lifespan? Can we change our activities or augment the genes so that we age better? Or augment anything so that we live longer? Again, a frequently asked question, and I see it in the clinic all the time. A gentleman in during the week, uh, aged 68, smoking 25 cigarettes a day. And I spoke to him, of course, the usual spiel about cigarettes and da da da, and he says, no, 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 not me. I have an aunt who lived to 100. <laughs> so we have to disabuse ourselves of this. At the best, and we know this from twin studies, Genes, per se, contribute to 20% of aging. The other factors, the factors that those kids, those 38-year-olds in Dunedin must have experienced to accelerate aging, they're the factors which really determine how we age. One of the fun bits about this whole area is identifying animals which have Ma huge longevity. I mean, this sponge, mobile, very slow growth rate, and the oldest known sponge is 1,550 years old. So we share a lot of, uh, at a molecular level, a lot of factors in common with the sponge. Wouldn't it be nice to know what what was contributing to aging uh, in the sponge that we might make some use of? The whale is the longest lived mammal, and again, the longest known uh, uh, lifespan to 211 years. This jellyfish creature, no known lifespan. Eternal youth goes from polyp to adult, back to polyp again. Which of us would want that? <laughs> so, What we do know is that many of these long-lived mutants are resistant to a thing called oxidative stress. Before the yawning starts, this has huge implications for lifestyle modification behaviours that are constantly being recommended, rarely adhered to or are applied, at a population level, and I think it's because people don't understand how they work. So let's work a little bit for a moment with oxidative stress. The millions of cells in all of our bodies at this, at this point in time are working to create energy so that we stay alive. Please, everybody, try to. <laughs> Whatever about not staying awake, don't die during the talk. <laughs> really rude. <laughs> So our cells are working to keep us alive, to keep me energized and moving, etc. And in order to do that, they create energy. But in the process of creating that energy, there are byproducts, just like with oil refineries, just like our cars. And the cell has a fantastically complex system to get rid of those toxins as soon as possible, because they're not good for the cell, and to continue generating energy. And that's why we're all alive. But it's the imbalance between that process, which is the fundamental template for the aging process. 
And one of the factors that we know is almost common to all aging, organ aging, is inflammation. So this imbalance is tied in with inflammation and eventually to cell destruction, cells not working properly, cell death. So understanding these toxic components, reactive oxygen species, that are released during this energy generating process helps us to understand the process behind cell damage and there's huge activity as you can imagine uh, um, in, in, in chemistry and biochemistry and other components of molecular medicine tracking all of the different pathways that lead to the toxin disposal process and understanding the rates and the re redefining of those pathways and the staving off of processes from those pathways and which of those are most damaging to the cell. But the things we know about managing high blood pressure in the middle of life, keeping your weight down, having a low cholesterol, being physically active, being happy, having good social networks, etc., all of those things we know are associated with this very process of energy generation and toxic waste uh, reduction and inflammation. So if we manage all of those things, these simple things, because they all act on that process, they act by keeping inflammation down, then we'll look at like this as opposed to a carnage. And that's why there's a difference between chronological and biological aging. It's this imbalance of these cellular processes triggered by environmental factors. Of, of people from Rosetta who were unemployed, emigrated, went to this Rosetta spot in the USA and set up a commune similar to their home in Italy, insofar as possible. A priest followed them shortly afterwards, and he was the one who instigated how Rosetta would be designed. Church in the middle, of course. Square around the church, and then the houses coming off the square, tall, just as they were in their home village, families living, all families, uh, generations of family living in one home. And on a Sunday, they would congregate for ages, talking and sharing stories, and then they'd all, if it was a fine day, bring their tables out into the square, all eat together, etc. And there were hours of this sort of engagement. And when they looked at all of their data on genetics, on, on the 40% had, had, had pizza was their staple diet, um, they smoked, they weren't particularly good at physical activity, they compared them to cohorts elsewhere in the States, others who'd gone from Rosetta in Italy to Rosetta in the States, they didn't find any difference in genetics, they couldn't explain the differences biologically. But it was one Sunday morning that Stuart Wolf, uh, uh, Wolf and his social science colleague made the observation that the secret of Rosetta was Rosetta itself. What I've just described to you, this social engagement. And this was one of the first observations which tied social activity, social engagement, what was considered soft science, even today by some, to hard biology. The secret was Rosetta itself. They visited each other, they chatted with each other, they cooked for each other. He learned about extending family networks. Three generations living in one room. Respect, respect for those who were older. At Mass he saw a unifying and calming effect of the church. And that there were 22 separate civic organisations for a town of 2,000 people. and an egalitarian ethos. Even if somebody was making more money than someone else, there was no blowing about it, no bragging. It was egalitarian. 
And then other work has followed from this, and this is just one meta-analysis which looked at 148 studies. And bottom line, showed that strong social relationships were as good at preventing cardiovascular disease as smoke, stopping smoking, alcohol excess, low physical activity, and high cholesterol. So, another way to look at what might be contributing to the aging process is to pick the blue zones. Are you familiar with the blue zones? Where they have a high proportion of people and some 12% of the population is aged over 100. And even in Japan, Japan as a whole now, as we talk about, you know, they're aging and they're top of the list, only 1% of their population as a whole are over 100. So let's look at the blue zones. The blue zones are Sardinia, uh, a small area in Japan, Loma Linda in California, little isolated peninsula in Costa Rica, and Icaria in Greece, the Greek island. So say, take those uh, five areas, and what do we know? We know they live longer, but they live better. A larger proportion don't have any of the uh, chronic diseases which we associate with aging, arthritis, dementia, um, cardiovascular disease, including stroke, etc. The population remained active and participating well into their 90s. We might give that message to our current president. <laughs> and when they tried to disaggregate, well, what are the, what are the real what are the things that these five widely disparately spread cohorts have in common? The first was physical activity. They move naturally throughout the day. Their activity comes from walking everywhere, gardening, housework, etc. Not driving to the gym, spending an hour there and driving back and spending the rest of the night and the next day sitting. So lifestyle, physical activity was integral to their lifestyle. Belonging, being part of a faith-based community adds four to 14 years to life expectancy. And being part of the right tribe was the other thing they had in common. The world's longest lived people have close friends and strong social networks, similar to the, the work from Rosetta. Close and strong family connections with spouses, parents, grandparents, and grandchildren. Purpose. In fact, in Japan and Costa Rica, they actually have names for what they call purpose. A reason to get up in the morning. Having a reason to get up in the morning. Feeling a valued part of society. Having purpose. About seven years to life expectancy, according to the studies. They also noted that the populations remained very physically active, well into their 80s or 90s. Stress is part of everybody's life, stress is part of these folks' life, but what they did have in common with all of the cohorts was stress-relieving rituals. Be it Adventists, which is the long-lived group in California, prayer. The Carians, an afternoon nap. And the Sardinians do happy. <laughs> and, the, and both Costa Rica and Sardinia make their own wine, which is shared during meals and happy hour. Food was a big thing, plants. The, what we traditionally call the Mediterranean diet, pretty much that was common to most. Beans were the cornerstone of most of the centenarians' diets. Vegetables, fruit, whole grains um, were, were common to all. The Adventists particularly liked nuts, legumes, but low sugar, low salt, and low refined grains. The, I like this that the Japanese have a saying, every day eat something from the sea and something from the land. And they use a lot of ginger and turmeric in their food preparation. 
And the Costa Ricans had a particular style of cooking, uh, their uh, tortillas, freshly made every morning, uh, cooked in such a way that they had 7.5 times more calcium, and thus unlocking certain amino acids in the cooking process. And one of our GBHI fellows at the moment is from Costa Rica, and, and he was saying that this is what in Costa Rica, the rest of Costa Rica, uh, attribute longevity in this particular peninsula to. And green tea, a special type of green tea in Japan. All of them had in com common moderate <laughs> wine consumption as part of lifestyle, but always with friends and with food. So, there are some, I think, interesting um, observations about factors which we know contribute to an extended lifespan. And in Tilda, we've been able to take some of these observations and apply them to the longitudinal study. And just for anybody who's not aware of it, it's a longitudinal study of almost 9,000 people aged 50 and above. It's a population representative sample. So we've taken the proportion of people aged 50, 60, 65, 70, etc., who are in Ireland now, and that proportion is represented in our study. Thus, we can generalize to the population as a whole when we make observations. And people are reassessed every two years, just like in the Dunedin study, etc. And thank you to anybody in this audience who is a participant, because the contribution that you're making to research in Ireland, but also to informing policy. Somebody told me recently that the TILDA study has been cited 120 times in the Iraq this since it started. So, so outcomes from the study are being used to guide and inform policy. And we look at all components, the wonderful rich tapestry of aging. Because as I said before, aging doesn't occur in, in isolation. It doesn't occur in one organ, and it doesn't occur in one research domain. Social science and economics and health hugely overlap. So that cross-sectoral approach to aging is really, really important, as I hope you understand now from understanding more about social engagement and the aging process. And altogether, we're putting together this tapestry of what it's like to grow older, the experience of aging in Ireland. The early risk factors for some of the um, disability-associated aging factors and how we can recognize those and act earlier. And therefore, influence policy, novel research. But we've designed the study so it's comparable across Europe. So we can make comparisons with the Swedes and find out from all of that tapestry of variables we collect, well, what are we doing that's different from Sweden? And how, what are the factors that explain the different healthy lifespan between the two countries? Funded by Atlantic Philanthropies, the Department of Health, and a grant from Irish Life. So, the good news is, and you can leave after this one, it's not the last slide, but you may, the quality of life gets better. It gets better after the age of 50. Peaks at about 66 to 68. And actually, you're aged 84 on average before your quality of life is what it was at 50. So, things can only get better. There is a song, and I will not sing. <laughs> but that, that's, 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 it. That's, that's the good news. When we compared quality of life, using the same metrics, because we can do comparability studies with our UK colleagues, this is pre any talk about Brexit, this is data that we analyzed about three years ago. We must repeat it, actually, <laughs> in the context of everything. You know, our, our, our quality of life in Ireland is better than in, in England, for all age groups. And we found that volunteering, social participation, looking after grandchildren, was associated with the highest quality of life. Again, these social engagement, social interaction factors determine high quality of life and less depression. And just a, a nice note on that. You know, I don't know, some, but there will be some people in the audience who know what it feels like after you've done a long jog running to have a runner's high. And that's attributable to cannabis-like substances that are released, neurotransmitters.
but consistent with this, there's been a very nice preliminary work to act to show that singing in a choir, which is a lot easier, can give you the same pie and the same release of these cannabinoid type substances. And this again is consistent with all of this, and of course, probably anti inflammatory. One of the studies that I love that has really helped us in understand this whole area is what's called the NUNS study. And this was done in the US, of course, in a, a order of nuns, of 678 sisters of Notre Dame. The average age of the sisters at entry into the study was 83. And the scientist who decided to study the nuns was David Snow. And he's been to Dublin, he's spoken to us in the, as part of the, in initiating the TILDA study some 10 years ago. Fantastic scientist. <clears throat> and he noted, he, he got all the, study, the nuns to enter the study, just like Tilda, followed them up at regular intervals and they donated their brains after they were dead, of course. And the, 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 uh, the, the, those neuropathological uh, studies, in addition to tracking the lifestyle uh, of the nuns and their health status, economic, social status, etc., has, has, has lent a lot to our understanding of the aging process. And he noted, unsurprisingly, that healthy lifestyle, active and stimulating intellectual life. So being here tonight ticks that box so you can go away happy. <laughs> Leads for a healthy and independent later. But what was really fascinating was when the nuns were entering the novitiate, they wrote a letter. After their first year, they wrote a reflection on that first year. And he had these records <coughs> kept, 60-year-old records. And he found that there were certain traits in a person's early 20s which actually determined how you aged later on in life. <coughs> Sister One, see what you think of this. I was born in September 26, 1909, the eldest of seven children, five girls, two boys. My candidate year was spent in the mother house teaching chemistry and second year Latin at Notre Dame Institute. With God's grace, I intend to do my best for our order, for the spread of religion and for my personal satisfaction. Sister two, God started my life off well by bestowing on me a grace of inestimable value. The past year which I've spent as a candidate studying at Notre Dame College has been a very happy one. Now I look forward with eager joy to receiving the holy habit of Our Lady and to a life of union with love divine. Sister one, do you agree, had a low positive emotion? I wouldn't like to be sitting across the desk room if I'd done something wrong. <laughs> Sister Two, on the other hand, had a completely different outlook. And what David Snowden's work showed was that <laughs> Sister One was more likely to get Alzheimer's disease and other degenerative diseases of aging. <laughs> Whereas Sister Two was not. And remarkably, even for the same density of what we consider to be Alzheimer's pathology in post-mortem, Sister 2 did not appear diagnostically to have Alzheimer's disease in life. So the message there is to stay mentally active, intellectually curious, and have a positive outlook on life. As young as you feel. Really nice work from Deirdre Robertson in the Tilda study has shown. That. When we asked our participants about their perceptions of how they were aging, and then we looked at their physical measures and cognitive measures after four years, the people who perceived themselves as being old walked more slowly, were physically and cognitively older, performed worse on the tests, than people who perceived themselves as youthful. That's why when Pat Kenny was interviewing me yesterday and talking about his 100-year-old aunt, I said, I bet she had attitude. Because you get to that age and have a party at 100, you've attitude. And we showed, indeed, that how you perceive yourself aging influences your walking speed, the aging process, your ability to exercise is integral to all of this, and of course your ability to exercise influences how you perceive yourself aging. So you could get into a big negative cycle by just having negative aging perceptions. And of course this is where I'm going to ageism. Because we have negative perceptions 
Because in our youth and as we're growing up, we see and we hear negative things about Asia. And even at the moment in the current debate, and I'm, you know, I'm not, not in any way endorsing any candidate, but there are outrageous, ageist comments being made because of someone's chronological age. Chronological age. <coughs> So what's well, some of the other things from the Tilda study? Siobhan Scarlet work has shown that if you sleep more than 10 hours or less than 7 hours at night, it influences the autonomic nervous system, the background system in the body, which is ticking away all of the time over which we've no control. But it's really important for our heart and our brain. And you are more likely to have impaired or, or, or less good cognitive function on our tests. And another study in Europe has shown more likely to have cardiac disease if you sleep too much or too little. And of course, this whole business of this, this capacity to, we're all stressed, but to get rid of some of that stress <coughs> is hugely important. And we've looked at the autonomic nervous system, that system that's churning away all of the time in the background and governing the function of every organ in the body, including our heart, and shown that people who have a better functioning autonomic nervous system are much less likely to get depression, cognitive impairment, falls, blackout, frailty. And the things you can do about that are things like mindfulness and yoga which reset your autonomic nervous system and allow the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the kind of good one for slowing things down, to be in balance with the sympathetic, which is our fight or flight response for it. So finally, caloric restriction. It does improve longevity in animals and in all of those uh, particular species we've looked at there. They live longer. Yeast, nematodes, rodents, and lower land animals. And this is a nice experiment in non-human primates, which show that it prevents age-related diseases, caloric restriction. And the restriction in these experiments was 40% of the average daily intake. And it, it, it actually prevented age-related diseases in the, in the group of non-human primates that were exposed to caloric restriction for diabetes, for cancer, for stroke, uh, for heart disease, for brain atrophy. <coughs> but the appearance was also interesting. So this this is uh, this is the uh, normal aging rhesus monkey. And this is the caloric restricted rhesus monkey. Same chronological age. But we don't know enough about caloric restriction for us to go home on 40% uh, reduction in our dietary intake. But it's interesting that the blue zone countries actually eat to 80% of feeling full. It was another common observation across all of the zones. In Tilda, we don't do so good in this in Ireland, in this particular domain, and we know that people who are overweight or obese in Ireland are much more likely to have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, increased inflammation when we've looked at it, some of the inflammatory responses, take less exercise, more likely to get diabetes. That's not just so in Ireland, it's so everywhere. Overweight is associated with these degenerative diseases. 43% of people over 50 in Ireland are overweight, and 36% are obese. Only 21% were within the normal uh, recommended levels. Vitamin D is another dietary one that I want to kind of uh, talk to you about, because it's something you can do something about when you're leaving here today. One in four over 50s were deficient in winter, the study finds. Big difference from the Tilda study in different parts of Ireland. So this is winter throughout Ireland, almost 65% overall were deficient in vitamin D. This is looking at spring and a little bit better on the East Coast than elsewhere. Summer, we're doing better. Uh, deficiency is less common, about 25% overall in Ireland, again, better on the East Coast. 
And then back into autumn, we're going back into deficiencies again. So you can have vitamin D measured, and if you are deficient, uh, less than 50 nanomoles per litre is the uh, cutoff that we use, and it's generally accepted. Take it, or just take it anyway, because it's so high with that. Is. We don't do well either in our food. This is the food uh, pyramid, and these are older adults from Tilda. This is the proportion of, of servings for each of these different elements, and this is a recommended um, servings. So six servings a day, for example, we're taking four of bread, cereals, potatoes, pasta, fruit and vegetable, 3.6, recommended five plus. In fact, a study from Imperial recommended 10 plus. But let's stay with five because we're not even achieving that. 2.5 in these servings versus three, etc. So the proportions of the types of food we're taking in not consistent with the recommendation. But there's hope. We can modify diet. And with respect to exercise, this is a great study from the Whitehall study. When we don't exercise, we're much more likely to get stiff vessels. And stiff vessels is what causes eventually high blood pressure, kidney disease, heart failure, and stroke. This study showed that people in the study who changed their level of physical activity during the Whitehall study, here, actually were able to change the pulse wave velocity, a measure of the stiffness of their vessels by increasing sports activity and reducing the amount of time they spent sitting watching television. That alone. So it didn't just make them feel better and improve their muscle mass, it actually had an impact on vascular stiffness. And for those of you who, who go out of here this evening and join a gym and start working out first thing tomorrow morning, as we get older, it's much more difficult to strengthen muscles without some assistance. And there's a lovely study recent from a, a group in Switzerland which has shown that replenishment, you know, you see young people, my son is somewhere in the audience, and he's always putting these amino acids into smoothies and stuff, but we should be doing it too. And the, the, well, the, what, the components that we should be interested in are isoleucine, valine, and leucine. They'll help you to build muscle strength as we get older because it's actually quite difficult to do it with exercise alone and without this little bit of assistance. Physical activity we don't do well on. A third are meeting the minimum requirements of 150 minutes of brisk walking a year. Or a week. A year, that's probably what we're doing, a year. <laughs> a week. That's a 30 minute brisk walk five days a week. Only a third are meeting that criteria in Ireland. So we can do lots about positive ageing, and I'm going to wrap up now. Social engagement and relationships at a personal level, but at a societal level. Maybe we should be thinking about this. Perceptions of how people are ageing. Exercise, vitamin D, diet. Use it, don't lose it with respect to brain function. Have a purpose. And do manage in midlife, in midlife. In midlife, in your 50s, know what your blood pressure is, know what your cholesterol is, know what your hemoglobin A1C or glucose is, know that you don't have diabetes, know these figures, and know them every year or two. We found that most people who had undiagnosed hypertension were men aged 50 to 58. We measured, we said they were hypertensive. According to criteria, they didn't know they were hypertensive. Almost 48%. Okay, can you take a pill? Is aging a disease? It's not a disease, it's a process. It's really important that we don't consider it as a disease because then you'll be admitted to hospital at 80 and some young, smart, junior doctor will say, ooh, they've got the aging disease, no point in treating their chest infection or their atrial fibrillation or whatever. It's not a disease, it's a process. But the consequences of it are treated. And this uh, Nature Review recommended that longitudinal data, just as we're doing in, in Tilda, is how we will actually better understand this process and they'd better be able to do something about it. There are drugs you'll hear about, and I'll just give you a bottom line. Metformin, which is used for diabetes, is looking promising. And we don't have the results of a large randomized control fully as yet. Um, and it may be something that's coming down the road. Growth, human growth hormone, again, it's being given to people in private clinics, and I know there are big businesses in Harley Street with respect to this. There is no clear evidence that it produces the aging process. Other things are rifampicin, 
for modifying amyloid B and tau oligomers, which are associated with the processes uh, of Alzheimer's disease. And you'll probably have heard about blood transfusion. So it's been shown in animals that if you take blood from young animals and you give it to older animals, that the cells in the older animals start to rejuvenate. So, this is from California. <laughs> and the doctor who's recruiting into the trial is asking a mere $285,000 for you to enroll. But it's from Florida. Um, but he's still discussing the final price tag with the Food and Drug Administration in the US. There's no evidence that this worked in humans as yet, because the studies haven't been done. But obviously, he's capitalizing on the fact that there may be something from the, uh, from the animal world. We, we, we translate then a lot of what I've shared to you back into our clinical practice in Mercer's Institute, which is a new institute opened in 2016 on St. James's Hospital site, a wonderful, wonderful institute with 116 beds, a huge ambulatory service for 30,000 people, um, where we do one site, one stop as, as, as far as possible, outpatient assessments and all of the different domains that are pertinent to aging. And we, we combine our knowledge of basic sciences from, from the Trinity Group predominantly and the population studies that is tilde with clinical care and new clinical research studies. And then we take that back out to community and community engagement. And this afternoon alone, uh, my, my CU in tilde, Niall Turner, has established a relationship with the GAA. And we're going to take tilde on a roadshow throughout Ireland, particularly rural Ireland, sharing what I've shared with you this evening, but also particularly hints, clues, <clears throat> ideas for people about how they can make their aging experience in Ireland better. We would have none of this without this great man, Chuck Feeney. This is from an article written by Conor O'Cleary, who's written his biography. And in 2003, Chuck Feeney signed off a decision to spend all of his fortune in his lifetime. 